Hello, hello. It's Sonny Melendres, and welcome to the positive side of the radio spectrum. This is the all-new Sonny Melendres Show. Every week, we strive to bring you entertainment and inspiration through storytelling, fascinating guests, exclusive celebrity interviews, and it's all delivered with lots of enthusiasm. Now, I'm very excited to welcome our new sponsor to the program. In fact, I was so impressed with this company that I became their spokesperson. That's right, Ideal Precision Roofing. Their website is idealprecisionroofing.com. Now, let's face it, here in the San Antonio area, throughout South Texas, those storms roll in, and on a yearly basis, almost like clockwork, there's all kinds of hail damage that uh, it happens to all the homeowners and business owners in the area, and you could be one of them and maybe not even know it. So it is extremely important that whenever you suspect your roof has suffered damage to call the experts at Ideal Precision Roofing. Now, here's what I've learned in talking to Michael Monk and all the experts at Ideal Precision Roofing. Not all roofing companies are alike. In fact, sometimes, in some cases, there's up to a 100 different companies that come into town, and maybe you've gotten these calls. We're going to be in your area. We're going to inspect your roof, et cetera, and you don't know who they are. They just call you out of the blue, and they come in, and they're from out of town. And consequently, the materials they use are not really what you would want on your roof. Not only that, but after they're gone, they're gone. That's why you want to call the experts at Ideal Precision Roofing. In fact, they are proudly an Owens Corning Platinum Preferred Contractor. That means they are in the top 1% in the country. So when you're looking for roof repair, especially from hail damage, call the experts at Ideal Precision Roofing. The number is 210-485-1553. That's 210-485-1553. Or visit them on the web at IdealPrecisionRoofing.com. And now, on with the show. Sunny Radio, SunnyRadio.com, San Antonio. Well, I am very excited to introduce you to my guest today. He is a producer and director for CBS Syndication and has worked on shows like Entertainment Tonight, Jeopardy, Dr. Phil. The list goes on and on. And he is also a longtime friend. Our careers crossed in radio in Los Angeles. It is my pleasure to introduce you to my friend, Kevin Gershon. Kevin, welcome. Thank you, Sonny. Nice to talk to you. <laughs> How long has it been? Wow, it, it, it has been it's been a minute or two. Uh, you and I worked together at KMPC from what 1974 or five through maybe 1980 80 or 81. Yes, exactly. And then I, I went to, uh, to do the Disney show, and then we, we met again at Magic 106 in Los Angeles. We did. Yes, we did. One of the I remember one of the fun things we did at KMPC Gene Autry Station was you hosted a weekend program called Weekend LA. Yes, and it was kind of a radio variety thing, and uh, every hour on the weekend, like from eight a.m. to like noon, Pete Smith and I would go out in the mobile unit to whatever was happening. Yeah, out in in LA, whatever the big thing, if they were opening a new ride at Universal Studios, I think they, when they put the Battle Scarred Galactica uh, attraction yeah. <laughs> out there, and we would go out there with this thing called a Marty unit. You'd have to put an antenna on the roof of the car and beam it back uh, to Mount Lee, and we would uh, do these live remotes with a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you, you just brought, you just took me down memory lane. And you know, and we should tell people that KMPC in Los Angeles at the time was the personality station in the country. In fact, uh, there was a, a, I don't you remember this, there was a label on all the correspondence that went out and said KMPC has more personalities uh, hosting national television shows than any other station in America. And it was true. They referred to it uh, in advertising as the station of the stars. But internally, if you were working in radio, you wanted to go there because it was radio heaven. It was. 
It was. It was unbelievable. They would send limousines out to, to all the personalities whenever we had a staff meeting. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you imagine? I, I tell people that and they don't believe it, you know, but it was it was truly an incredible, amazing once in a lifetime experience. And and uh, we were all so fortunate to be there. Gary Owens, Wing Martindale, Jeff Edwards, Dick Whittinghill and Robert W. came over. Uh, I mean, Correct. It was just just incredible. All right. So we're going to start out by getting you into the business. And I'm going to go all the way back to where you were in the, either kindergarten or first grade. And you were actually on the Art Linkletter show. That's true. Um, uh, 1966, Art Linkletter had a show on CBS uh, called House Party, or sometimes referred to as like his radio show, Kids Say the Darndest Things. Correct. And it was shot over at uh, CBS Television City uh, on the same stage where uh, they did the Carol Burnett show following him and uh, where they do Price is Right now. And in order to get guests for the show, they would go to all the local elementary schools and try to find um, what they called then precocious children. (laughs) Uh, um, And somehow they thought I was precocious. Yeah. And I got invited to be on the show. And uh, one of the funny stories is, uh, you know, they don't they don't prep it really ahead of time. They ask you questions. But then Art kind of goes his own way, says, uh, Kevin Gershon, what does your dad do to help your mother around the house? And I was like, oh, he's an attorney. And he goes, well, that's outside the house. What does he do to help your mother uh, inside the house? Now, I don't know. There must have been a party or something at the house that yeah. weekend or whatever. Uh, he makes cocktails. But, well, <laughs> fathers are sure helpful around the house. So now I get home, I hear this screeching in the driveway. Yeah. And my father is living. The door comes in and it slams and he's... Kevin Mitchell Gershon, get in here right now. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I do the uh, Harry Letterman voice. When I do my voice. <laughs> yeah, and leave it to Beaver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says, uh, yeah, I saw it. He says, I just graduated law, law school and passed the bar, and you just told the whole country I worked behind one. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was not happy. Kevin Gershon, what's your dad do around the house? He's an attorney. He's an attorney. That's outside the house. What does he do to help your mother? Uh, he uh, makes cocktails. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was the days of live television. So he, he yeah, uh, with live he, television. Yeah, and uh, it was great. Years later, by the way, maybe in the late nineties, uh, Bill Cosby revived the show with Art Linkletter. And um, I got invited back. They went. They found the kids that they liked the most. But the the beauty of it was when we went to tape the uh, revival of that. Every single member of the audience was a child that was once on our show. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Yeah. I remember seeing that that special. It was incredible, and Art was just brought to tears when he saw all of you, and they all stood up and then surrounded him. And uh, and you even mentioned that uh, at the time, Art was like David Letterman. You know, he was uh, he was a big deal. To uh, yeah, he was you know he was like Johnny Carson yeah, or David yeah, Letterman yes. pre all of that. You exactly. Know, and by the way, you and Art have something to come. You know, he worked in love with children, and all the years I worked with you, you always made a, a point to work with and um, just adore children and uh, absolutely. Really high- you know, it's a, it, it, it's a great thing. There are, you know, there's people in show business who do that. And Art Linkletter is one of his time and you're one of yours. Oh, but it's very kind of you to say that. That's very nice of you to say that. And it takes one to uh, to recognize one. Yeah. Uh, now. All right. So that we, you, you're, you, you get into television. I mean, you, you have this one little uh, thing that you did there. But then uh, when you're in like middle school or high school, oh, I no. understand that you and some buddies, a couple of buddies of yours, uh, we're on the Gong Show. Tell me about okay. that. <laughs> All right. So uh, Chuck Barris, who was the producer of many shows like uh, the Newlywed Game and the Dating Game, yes, also hosted and produced the Gong Show. And while uh, I was in uh, junior high school, they called middle school junior high then. Um, a couple of friends of mine and I, we were just trying to find a way to get on the show because it was silly. And long before there were these acapella groups like, you know, uh, 
Rockapella or Naturally Seven or right. any of those. We decided, oh, one of my friends, Hal Lipson, who's a uh, publicist now, actually played the drums. And another friend, John Rutenberg, actually played the bass. And But they could emulate those with their mouth. Yes. And we could do things at school. So we came up with this group called Mouth Power and <laughs> went on the gong show and you know and played uh, when the saints go marching in yeah we didn't uh, we didn't do very well we got gone <laughs> go go figure go figure yeah <laughs> all right now let, let's fast forward uh you are uh, visiting the studios of khj and I would imagine right. this was like in the 70s and, and you're in high school and, and you, um, you're you just kind of, you know, looking, you're interested in radio, you're l- walking around. And at the time, that was the station. In fact, uh, this format, uh, the boss format was a big format of uh, the Bill Drake was the architect and they had stations across the country. And no matter where you grew up, you probably listened to a to a Drake station with those jingles and that uh, that boss format. Uh, so tell me about that experience. That actually started before that in elementary school. It was a different time. You know, it's not like you know, now you don't even want to leave your kids out in your front you know, yard without watching. But back then, even as a nine year old kid, I could, you know, go get on the bus, get on the 101 H from the valley, go into Hollywood and, you know, go bug people at radio stations. And I wow. used to I used to always call in, first of all, trying to win the contest. Sure. Um, and I figured out phones were on a what they called a rotary then. So, um, uh, you know, it used to be call 520-1967. And if you was the, we'll take the fifth call. Yeah. You know, it was like, you know, 520-1971 would be the fifth call and you could dial right in. And, you know, they hadn't figured out all that ah, stuff. Ah, okay. You, you, could, you, you could figure out what the fifth call was and dial right yeah. into that number. But, but a fifth grader could figure it out. <laughs> Apparently, yes. You know. So the interestingly, uh, in 1966, when uh, uh, they did the Bat Phone Secret Number Contest, which, by the way, is highlighted in the ending credits of Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where there's a lot of KHJ air chat. Yes. <laughs> This is Batman. And Robin. With exclusive news for KHJ listeners. It's the Bat Phone Secret Number Contest presented by Boss Radio. There's a terrific prize for the first KHJ listener to guess the secret number of our Bat Phone. You've seen us answering the Bat Phone on TV. It's a special hotline Commissioner Gordon uses to contact us whenever there's trouble. There are seven digits in the Bat Phone's secret number. Listen to what you'll win if yours is the first correct answer received by KHJ. You'll visit Batman and me at 20th Century Fox and be our guest for lunch at the studio. Then you'll ride to the Batcave in the Batmobile, where Robin and I will present you with a 1966 console color television set. To visit us and win the color TV, just guess the secret Bat phone number. Watch for Robin and me on Channel 7 Wednesday and Thursday nights. And keep it on KHJ for more clues in the Bat phone secret number contest. <laughs> Play the bat. They played the bat phone secret number contest, and you won a uh, console television, a color television, and a trip to the bat cave. I won that. Wow! Uh, until then, Robert W. Morgan's yet to be wife, Shelley Gordon, to become Shelley Morgan, who was the program director, Ron Jacobs' secretary, was informed to tell me I could not win any more contests, <laughs> and I had to escorted out of the building. <laughs> But I used to go. I used to go there all the time. And one of the ways I got to go in, I, there was a, a. If you were a kid, there was a thing called a phone freak. So if you knew about telephones, and you like, I read a lot, and I knew about phones. Yes. There used to be these numbers you could call to either make the phone ring that a phone person who would come to your house to test it, or you could have it read your number back, and it would go two one three five 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 one two one two. Yes. So, uh, as you know, being a radio station, radio stations had what was called a hotline that only the program director oh, oh, had no. a number of. And oh, no. Oh, no. Call and yell at you. <laughs> but 
people would find it out and would have their wives and girlfriends and uh, you know concubines call. Yeah. So since I knew this readback number <laughs> and I wouldn't give it up, they would let me in because I would go to the hotline and figure out what the number was and give it to them. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, you know, yeah. it, it, again, you know, you're, you're using your ingenuity. You're not hurting anybody. And you're just no. so fascinated with this incredible medium. Um, so at, at what point then did you actually get a job in radio? Okay. Were you an so intern radio, or what? People don't get it today. But radio was bigger than anything. It yeah. was your friend. It was your yeah. companion. And the people who did it right, such as you, I always called good broadcasters. You weren't talking to millions of people in Los Angeles. No. If you did it right, you were talking to one person. Exactly. And you, as one person at the other end of the radio, were listening to it. You got to listen to people's lives. Some people were just announcers. This is, that was, I am. You and others, Robert W. Morgan, people like that, all most of the people at KMPC knew how to communicate one-on-one -on -one to people. So you felt you knew about their lives, you especially. You know, you called your mother all the time. I you did. knew about your mother. We felt we knew her and all of those things. And so even though you didn't, you felt that uh, the radio personalities were your friend. There was a... Um, Speaking of KHJ, there was a teenage fair at the Hollywood Palladium in the late 60s, and a poll was taken and asking um, kids who they trusted most, and disc jockeys came in third behind uh, parents and teachers. Isn't that something? Right. And so it was a huge medium. The, it, you couldn't go anywhere. Whatever the number one radio station was in your town, whether it was Boss Radio 93 KHJ here or maybe 77 WABC in New York, it, it, it permeated the town. You couldn't go anywhere. You heard them in gas stations. You, if someone was stopped at a light, you heard it. If you were at the beach, you heard it. If you were at a park, you heard it. So back in the 60s, we all walked around with little transistor radios which were the size of iPods or smaller. They, you know, that was the yeah. period of time where we, they tried to make them We so slept small. with them, yeah. Yeah, we slept with them. And, you know, many a teacher has many of my the transistor radio in their desk drawer probably <laughs> to this day. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't really care about TV then. I, I cared about radio. I wanted, I wanted to be in radio and specifically wanted to go to KHJ or... KMPC, because that was the station my parents listened to, and I liked it as well. Mm. So whether it was summer or, or breaks or after school, I was always in Hollywood going to different radio stations. Wow. There was, um, and then on the weekends, KISS AM used to broadcast from a radio uh, studio at Universal Studios, which was then free to get into. And, you know, I would go up there. So finally... Uh, in 1974, uh, Robert W. Morgan and the real Don Steele, formerly of KHJ, along with Drake Chenault, went to K100 on the FM dial yes. in 1974. And I got a paid internship job there in 1974 while still going to school. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't believe this. They're paying me yes. to come here. Yes. And whatever. You'd get you'd get coffee for the disc jockeys. You would file the records away. You would go rip the wire to bring them the weather. Well, you know, whatever they needed. Yes. And you got paid and you got paid minimum wage. And uh, you know, it was a way to be around these people that you put a face with a name with, and it was great. So that was my my first paid job in radio. All right, I want you to stop you right there because when we come back, we're going to get you not only in a paid job in radio, but really you made it to the big time and then talk about your incredible career in television. When we return on the Sonny Melendrez Show. Sonny Radio. The Sonny Melendrez Show is brought to you by Ideal Precision Roofing. Now, one of the greatest damages resulting from hail involves your roof on your home or your business. And if it's not resolved quickly by a hail damage roofing expert, the damages can spread to other parts of your structure and cause all kinds of other very costly consequences. Now, I will tell you that a telltale sign that hail damage has occurred is often when shingles appear to be asymmetrical. That is, they're, they're no longer square with one another. Sometimes you can see them from 
where you stand out in front of your house, your backyard, maybe you're looking at your uh, at your business. If something looks off, it's always best to be safe and get an inspection from the Hail Damage Emergency Roof Repair Professionals at Ideal Precision Roofing. They will give you a free estimate, no cost to you. Just give them a call at 210-485-1553. That's 210-485-1553, or visit them at idealprecisionroofing.com and tell them Sonny Melendres sent you. We're back with Kevin Gershon. Kevin, what would you say your title is now? That's very interesting. Uh, technically, I'm a producer-director for CBS Television Distribution. I'm based at Entertainment Tonight but I work on all the CTD products. So I work on Entertainment Tonight, um, Dr. Phil, The Doctors, Rachel Ray, Inside Edition, uh, Judge Judy, Hot Bench, Wheel of Fortune, and Jeopardy. Wow. Wow. Well, I want to talk about those, but let's pick up on your radio career because now you're, uh, you're, you're past being an intern and you're actually a, a producer of sorts, right? Right. Well, my, ne- my next job is I go to KMPC. Now, KMPC uh, at the time is on Sunset Boulevard in a big White House-looking building. Beautiful. It's, it's the most amazing. No, no radio station's uh, physical presence from an exterior looks like this. No. It's really amazing. It looks like it's the worth- White House. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a uh, tribute site at 710kmpc.com that people can look up, and there's some photos of there to see that. Um, anyway, so I get a job there. The first job when you go to KMPC is you, it was called the sports wire. Now, the reason it's called the sports wire, there was a answering machine that they used to have in the newsroom that if you wanted the sports scores 24 hours a day, you would call the KMPC sports wire at Webster 83000. Yes. By the way, that's how they used to give out phone numbers. The first two letters were Webster or state or popular or yeah. press view. Yeah. And, um, so you would do that. So you would do a couple things. A, in the newsroom, you would rip the Associated Press, UPI, and City News, News Service wires and sort them out on a board for the newsmen, as well as changing the ink in those wires and keeping all the sports scores, bringing the weather to the disc jockeys, and actually learning to and then eventually writing the sports copy for the newsmen uh, to read. And KMPC was the flagship station for the UCLA Bruins football and basketball, uh, the Los Angeles Rams football, and California Angels baseball, right. which state owner Gene Autry owned. And that was my first job there, doing that along with a thing they called Beach Reporter, where you would sit and you would call all the lifeguard stations uh, from <laughs> uh, the Mexican border to Santa Barbara and every hour bring that beach report into uh, the, uh, Program. the jock on the yeah. air. Yeah. And they would read the beach report. And occasionally, because you were a cute kid at that point, and they try to help you out knowing you'd want to be in radio. So, oh, uh, little Kevin Gershon uh, came in here today with the beach report. Kevin, you want to do the beach report? And you yeah. Go, ah, yeah, the beach report. <laughs> You know, and so that, <laughs> you know, that was great. And then maybe your parents or grandparents heard it and stuff like that. And yes. eventually, um, I worked, I did every job in the building. I worked in the uh, music library. I was an engineer. I was the assistant program director. And, and then eventually got to produce Robert W. Morgan's a morning show. Robert W. Morgan took over for another 30 year veteran, uh, Dick Whittinghill at yes. KMPC. Morgan took over for him at KMPC and asked if I would like to produce his show. And I mean, like, what? What do you mean what I like to produce your show? What do I know about producing radio? He says, well, you've heard most every show I've done since I was on the air. I can think of nobody better to do it. Exactly. You know, also, by the way, and, and besides that, sometimes I would be lucky enough. I would get one of the things I love to do is uh, KMPC had a different format. They, they let the jocks pull their own music. Yes. And sometimes you would let me pull the music for your show, which I loved because... 
you always wanted to have a real positive spin on the music. You weren't just pulling the music. Exactly. So it was great. Like yours was like pulling music for a theme show. It things had to have the right tempo going one into the other. They had to have a positive message. It was it was like your show was a happy show to listen to. It was. It was. And and to this day, to this day, my well, this this program here, it's the corner of uh, of inspiration and entertainment. You know, I, I've always, uh, always enjoyed having that that positivity uh, on the on the airwaves. Uh, but well, you it was, great. It was great. Always about your show. You know, you heard some people were informative. Some of them, they were playing the top hits. Other people, they were just funny. Some other people were irreverent. But you always left your three, four, or five-hour show, like, with a smile on your face, feeling good. Very kind of you to say that. Well, that was my that was my whole intention. Always has been. Uh, so there you are. You're working for Robert W., uh, one of the greatest talents of all time. And uh, and so how did you transition from there to, to television? Well, interestingly, it, while working at KMPC, Gene Autry, who owned the station, also owned the television station on the same lot, KTLA. So his good friend, um, Johnny Grant, his good friend, Johnny Grant, oh, yeah. the of course. official mayor of Hollywood, yeah. had a show over there. And so I would go hang out there and sometimes they would let me participate in activities there. Or I would go to the newsroom and learn about television a little bit there. In 1979, when Morgan took over for Dick Whittinghill, a show by the name of Solid Gold launched. And it was the first ever nationally first run syndicated show and what that means is it's not a network show that then ran on one of the three networks cbs abc nbc fox wasn't around yet um it was placed on stations individually and all, although it may have been mostly on a particular group of stations it could go anywhere at any time yes and the producer of that show brad lockman used to work at khj tv channel 9 in the same building as boss radio 93 khj and was always a fan of morgan's mm. so when they needed an announcer for the show they selected morgan to be the announcer for solid goal yes and morgan knew that i was both producing and engineering his show at the time that i had a unique ear for his voice and wanted me to come and go to the sweetening sessions. So I kind of got into it because he got me the job as part of the deal. Was part of the deal if you know, when you hire me, can you also hire Kevin to come to the There you go. Ex explain what a sweetening session is. A sweetening session is after they shoot the television show, um, there are many things that happen. They put the announcer's voice in at the top of the show and for the bumpers. And then they also mix in the audience and the music. All the things are already placed where they are. But from an audio standpoint, the sweetening session is like a mixing session for it before they take that audio and do what they call lay it back to the uh, video before they present it on television. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I started doing that. So I started working on the show day one, June 1st of 1979. And I got to do that. And I eventually ended up selecting the music. Part of that show, the Solid Gold Dancers danced to that week's top 10 hits. But the show taped six weeks out. So we needed to predict what the top 10 songs were going to be on Solid Gold six weeks out. So through a combination of industry magazines like Billboard magazine, Radio and Records, Cashbox, and calling huge record stores in the in the top 25 markets, we had to come up with what the top 10 songs of that week were going to be. And sometimes if they're close, to tell you the truth, so maybe a song that was only going to make it to number 14 was, and our top 10 song this week is Eddie Rabbit, who's on the show. Yeah. And I love a rainy night. So it was um, producer's choice a little bit. So when you did all this, then you got not only experience, but also you had another incredible feather in your cap uh, in television. And then how did it lead to what you're doing now with CBS? Well, um, then uh, Solid Gold was produced by Paramount Domestic Television. Um, eventually, two years later, Entertainment Tonight came on the air and they asked me to participate in that. And then other shows like Maury and Montel and Hard Copy and things like that. 
Um, so you've been Paramount Domestic Television became CBS Paramount Television, then became CBS Television Distribution, all of which fall under the bigger Viacom banner. Right. So as uh, more and more television stations came into or television programming came into syndication and I was there being there from day one of the division, um, I would participate in other ways. So I've had my fingers in every single now CBS television distribution show ever in existence. Uh, and June 1st of this year was my 40th year with a company making me the longest CBS television distribution employee. Wow. And that's the most, that's the most boring speech anyone's ever heard. No, no, that is incredible. You know, and, and it's, what's incredible also is we started this interview with you uh, at a CBS show with Art Linkletter, and here you are now, a 40-year veteran of of that uh, of that studio. I mean, how amazing that is. Yeah. It just goes to show you that when you have that, that childlike dream of anything can happen, and you are literally, you know, getting on a bus and going to Hollywood. I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, but I, I think that that there is there was a there's a lot to be said about that that uh, childlike vision that that you had, and also the, it continues. I can hear it in your voice. You know, you're. Well, you know, I, I I've always liked what I do. You know, I, if you see that um, uh, last night, if you saw on America's Got Talent, the autistic. Uh, kid who won the competition is a is a kid. He always wanted to sing and stuff like that. So it doesn't matter. Like like you said, if you're a kid and you have that dream, and your parents and your friends and your teachers right in, encourage you. Like and I know that's what you do with kids. Okay, it's like if you can just take, you know, my grandfather said to me, Kevin, figure out what it is you love, then get to get someone to pay you to do it. And I think if you if you follow your dreams and you really dive into what you love, you can't help but succeed at it. Amen. Amen. Your, your grandfather was a very wise man. So now, Entertainment Tonight enters its 39th season. You've been there the whole time. How do you keep people interested and how do you keep it fresh? You know, it's interesting. When we first started, um, there was a lot of uh, skepticism that there's not going to be enough entertainment news to fill a half hour television show <laughs> five days a week. Amazing. And, and it was crazy that people said no. And it turned out, you know, early on, it wasn't as easy as, uh, you know, electronic news gathering isn't what it is today where, and there was certainly no internet and you had to shoot on film and go develop that. And, the routine wasn't there for the stars. So when we started showing up behind the scenes of movies, television shows, um, movie premieres, uh, doing interviews and stuff like that, um, it was new. Now you can't think we're such a pop culture obsessed. You know, there's not just entertainment tonight. There's so many other shows on broadcast, on cable, on broadband um, that, um, not only is there enough to fill a half hour every day, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are there are networks that broadcast 24 uh, seven, sure. 365 days a year. Sure. And back then there was no Internet. Who would have thought that we'd, we'd be sitting here? In fact, that's how we're, we're uh, really connecting right now on uh, on Zoom. Uh, but, you know, the incredible part of your career uh, in radio and in television is is that you've always not only enjoyed it, but you have made other people look good. You know, they always say that, again, you know, most of my wisdom I got from my, my grandfather. He says, never ask or tell anybody anything you don't have a pretty good idea of how to do yourself. So as I went through the business, I tried to learn every job in the building mm. so that when I'm asking somebody to work with me and I'm needing them to do a task that I can't do because of a union uh, problem or whatever it is that I have an idea of what they're doing. Not only are they more likely to help you, but they respect you because they know you understand what you're doing. So the object is here, come to work, make people feel good about what they're doing. Don't, don't berate them 
or tell them what they're doing wrong, mm. you know, get their opinion, tell them what they're doing right. Eventually, if you're the boss, sometimes you have to make a decision contrary to what they like. But at the at the end of the day, you can't put on a television show like Entertainment Tonight without the other 150 people who work here and everybody plays a part. And so you have to like everybody from the head of the studio to the, uh, you know, just coming in uh, production assistant and treat them with the same respect. Amen. Amen. Just like the respect you got when you were a kid starting out and you had uh, broadcasters, the big names that you listened to all your life. Uh, they were trying, you know, giving you not only encouragement but also helping you out, and that was really kind of the culture. No, that was you. That was you. Everybody was me. Is get this kid out of the building. <laughs> you were encouraging other pe- other people. Like like uh, who 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 are you? What are you doing here? Get out. <laughs> everybody was go- everybody was going to the boss's office saying, "It's this kid or me. You got to get this kid. He's bugging. He's bugging me. He's asking me so many questions. I'm trying to do my job, and he keeps asking oh. me, why are we doing it this way?'" <laughs> Now, see, you, you were excited. Truly, you were one of the few people who took time and sat down with me and said, "Oh, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it?" And, and every question I asked, you were you were kind and answered. Well, I tell you, I, we're we're we we were of the same breed. I, I think uh, we were well taught by our uh, our parents and grandparents. Uh, Kevin Gershon, I congratulate you, and I, I wish you many many more years in this incredible, wonderful, magical world of broadcasting. And you are truly not only an um, example of what can happen when somebody does have that dream, but more so when somebody translates that into kindness all along the way before you and after you. I congratulate you on that. Thank you, Sonny. And if you, you know, get here to Hollywood, come around, love to show you around the uh, ET studio. Great, great. We'll do the show from there. All right. Well, that's my visit with CBS producer-director Kevin Gershon. And by the way, you'll find the links to everything we talked about, including all about the new season of Entertainment Tonight, and you'll find the tribute site to KMPC in Los Angeles, all at sunnyradio.com slash show. That's sunnyradio.com slash show. Hope you enjoyed the show. It was brought to you by our great sponsor, Ideal Precision Roofing. And don't forget, if you have hail damage, call the experts at Ideal Precision Roofing. Call them for a free estimate at 210-485-1553. Or visit them at IdealPrecisionRoofing.com. Till next time, I'm Sonny Melendrez. Bye-bye. (laughs) 